Hey guys, Jake here, coming at you with another math lesson today. Here's the problem we're going to be going over today. Uh, we're basically just going to be using the definition of the limit to prove this limit right here. And you know, clearly, just taking a quick look at this limit, we can tell pretty easily that the you know that this limit equals 12 just by you know this is a polynomial which is uh, going to be continuous everywhere. So we could pretty easily tell that if we just basically plug in two into this, we're going to get 12. However, what we're going to do is use the actual definition of what a limit is to prove that this is the case. And I'm going to be going over this pretty much how it's described in this book right here. It's called Calculus by Michael Spivak. Um, this is one of the best books I've ever read that talks about, you know, basically proving limits using the definition of what a limit is. Um, so I highly recommend this book if you want to kind of dive deep into that kind of stuff. Um, it's a really good calculus book that, that goes a lot into proof proof-based problems and kind of proving a lot of the theories and stuff that are used in calculus. But let's go ahead and jump into this problem. So first of all, we need to start with the definition of a limit. Obviously, if we're trying to use the definition of the limit to prove the following limit, we're going to need to use what that definition of the limit is. So basically what the definition of a limit says is for all epsilon, so, you know, basically this epsilon could be any number greater than zero. For all epsilon, there needs to exist some delta, which is also greater than zero, such that for all x, if the absolute value of x minus a is between zero and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l needs to be less than epsilon. So essentially all this is saying is we need to figure out what delta would essentially make this whole thing work. So let's kind of break down these different pieces here. Basically our goal here is to figure out some relationship between epsilon and delta that no matter what epsilon we're given we can find some delta so that, you know, if our x is within delta units away from a, we can guarantee that our, our output of our function f of x is within epsilon units away from l. So let's kind of think about each of these pieces, uh, kind of coming back to this limit here. Basically, our a is going to be the value that x is approaching in our limit. So this right here is our a. And then this right here is our f of x. This is the function that we're taking the limit of. And then this over here is our l, which is essentially what the limit is equal to. So basically, if we put these kind of three pieces of information into this stuff down here, uh, you know, t pretty much what we want to do is start with kind of start from the end and work our way backwards. And I'll show you what, why that kind of ends up helping us out later on. So essentially, we just want to start with this right here. The absolute value of, of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So if our f of x is x squared plus 5x minus 2, and our l is 12, this equation right here would give us the absolute value of x squared plus 5x minus 2, which is what our f of x is, minus our l, which is 12. And then that needs to be less than epsilon. So essentially our goal here is to work our way backwards to where we can get something that looks like the absolute value of x minus a is less than some delta. We're going to have to kind of artificially pick our delta, but we do want to kind of work our way backwards to get the absolute value of x minus a somewhere in there. So basically what our goal to kind of look for is we're trying to basically show that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. So in this case, if the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon, which means in this case, the absolute value of x squared minus 5x minus 2 minus 12 is less than epsilon. So we need to work our way backwards from this to get something with 
you know, some inequality basically with the absolute value of x minus 2. So first of all, let's just kind of go back up to this and simplify this. So if we have these, you know, this in here, we can pretty much just start with combining our like terms. So that'll give us the absolute value of x squared minus 5x minus 14 is less than epsilon. And then what we can do is basically factor this out into the absolute value of x minus 7 times the absolute value of x plus 2. And we need to, you know, if we can make sure this is going to be less than epsilon, then this will also be less than epsilon. Because basically these two terms down here, the product of these two terms is going to be at least as big as this thing that we started with. So if this is less than epsilon, then this will also be less than epsilon. So we're okay. And I'm sorry, I just realized we had a plus 5x up here. So this should be a plus 7 and a minus 2. So we have the, the product of the absolute value of x plus 7 and the absolute value of x minus 2. And we need to make sure that's less than epsilon. So this absolute value of x minus 2 here is exactly what we had here. So we're, we're getting closer to something we want. Basically what we need to do now is basically get this x minus 2, the absolute value of x minus 2 by itself. But the problem is this absolute value of x plus 7 over here. We can't just really say that this is you know that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than some some epsilon some constant which is what we need epsilon is supposed to be a constant we can't just divide the x plus 7 over and call it good because we need this to be a constant over here so what we need to do is figure out some constant that x plus 7 is going to be less than as well and then we can basically replace it in here since we have an inequality so this is where this idea gets kind of weird is we will basically just pick some some number that our x absolute value of x plus 7 will always be less than. Well, remember, the idea here is basically our x is some value that's somewhere around 2, right? We're taking the limit of this function as x approaches 2. So we can assume that our x is going to be in the, the neighborhood of x equals 2. So if we want to find some kind of upper bound for this absolute value of x plus 7, if we know that our x is going to be near 2, we can basically just say kind of artificially, and we can pretty much pick this to be whatever we want. But let's just say that our x is going to be within one unit of x equals 2. So in other words, if x is going to be within one of x equals 2, that tells us that our x is going to be between 1 and 3. Right? We just kind of made that up, but we know that our x is going to be somewhere around 2 because we're taking the limit as x approaches 2. So let's just make it uh, a range of 1 on either side just to make things easy. So this is the same as saying the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1. Right? Basically the distance between x and 2 is less than 1, or x is within 1 unit of 2. So what this also tells us is x plus 7 is going to be between 8 and 10. We can basically just take this inequality and add 7 to the left, middle, and right side of the inequality. So we get x plus 7 is between 8 and 10. So what that tells us is that the absolute value of x plus 7 is going to be less than 10. right? We just figured out x plus 7 is going to be stuck between these two numbers. The absolute value of x plus 7 is going to be less than 10. So basically we can say that this absolute value of x plus 7 is less than 10. Therefore, as long as we make sure 10 times the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon, we should be good. So what we can do then is divide this 10 over to the other side, and that tells us the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than or equal to epsilon over 10. So basically what we can do now is say that epsilon over 10 equals delta. If we pick our delta to equal epsilon over 10, then we would have that delta, this should not be less than or equal to, just less than, we would have delta being less than the absolute value of x minus 2, which is exactly what we needed, right? If the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, then we know that this inequality would hold up as well because we've just kind of made this determination here. 
But remember, the, the other important thing to keep in mind here is that this also depended on the fact that the absolute value of x minus 2 is also less than 1. So basically, as long as this absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1 and it's less than epsilon over 10, we should be good. So basically, we need to say that delta is, actually what we should say is delta is going to be the minimum of epsilon over 10 and 1. Because as long as delta was the smaller between epsilon over 10 and 1, then we know that this inequality right here would hold up. And we also know that this inequality right here would hold up. And if both of these inequalities hold up, then we know that this would hold up, which is exactly what we needed to prove for this limit, right? Let's kind of go back to the, the wording up here. It essentially is saying whatever epsilon we pick, it doesn't matter. Epsilon is just some, some constant, some really small number. Whatever epsilon we pick, that's obviously a positive number, there exists some delta greater than zero. So basically, there has to just be some delta so that if this inequality is true, then this inequality is also true. Well, we just figured out no matter what epsilon it is, as long as delta to be the minimum of epsilon over 10 and 1, and if this inequality is true, which we know it is when delta is the minimum between these two values, we just showed it down here, then this inequality will also be true, right? We can kind of work our way backwards now. If we, we take our delta to be the minimum of these two values, and we just start with the absolute value of x minus 2 being less than our delta, then we can just do the reverse order up here, make our steps go backwards of what we did down here, and we end up showing that all true. So therefore, we, we just prove that if delta is this minimum of epsilon over 10 and 1, then all these conditions are met based on the definition of a limit, and that shows that this limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 5x minus 2 would be 12. So this is the delta that we need to prove that. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like. Subscribe to my channel. Those are great ways to help support the channel so I can keep making more videos like this. Thank you and see you next time.